Hello, my name is Kyle Ruddy, and thank you for joining today's live stream event. Today, we are very excited to introduce a new feature by the name of No Code Provisioning, which is now available in Terraform Cloud as a public beta. Joining me today is Olivia Corley, project or product manager, and Dan Barr, technical product marketing manager. During our session, we'll jump into some of the latest information on no code provisioning, see a live demo, and then follow that with some Q&A time. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available after post-processing, which usually takes about two business days. Uh, lastly, please type your questions in the question box below. Uh, we will answer them during, the, uh, during our end Q&A section. So with that, let's jump in and let me turn it over to Olivia. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Olivia. I am a product manager on Terraform. Um, I want to talk to you uh, today about no code provisioning, which is now available in public beta for Terraform cloud business and it will be coming to Terraform Enterprise later this month. As we think about enabling our developers uh, internal to our organizations or other Terraform consumers in our organizations, um, one piece of feedback we often get um, is that a lot of these people don't know how to use Terraform, maybe don't have time to learn Terraform, um, but they have a lot of infrastructure needs. And the bottom line is that they really care about deploying uh, just the app they need or the database they need or the server they need. Um, this is something that we have been working to address with the introduction of the private registry in Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise, basically to make it easier to publish validated and approved modules that can be reused by others in an organization. Um, however, using the private registry and modules therein still require a bit of knowledge um, around using the modules, Terraform, using setting up workspaces. Um, so we started looking at ways to simplify uh, this provisioning process. Um, in 2022, we did a state of cloud survey. And in that we found that um, skill shortages were ranked as the top multi-cloud barrier for technology practitioners and decision makers. Um, traditionally provisioning something immediately useful with Terraform requires knowledge of infrastructure or networking as well as familiarity with HCL, which can create um, a barrier to immediate use of Terraform. Um, in fact, uh, one in five companies reported that they are still struggling to gather the skills needed to staff a platform team and um, serve all of their company's infrastructure needs uh, promptly. Um, but to help most respondents say um, that they are standard, standardizing on a cloud operating model, including shared workflows to help fill these skills gaps. So where does no code provisioning come in in all of this? Um, we would say that you probably wanna try out no code provisioning if one or many of these situations apply to you or your organization. If your organization has a small platform team, um, but a lot of infrastructure requests, um, or if you want people to use Terraform to deploy infrastructure within your organization, but you don't want them touching module code, um, other situations that might apply to you are you're getting requests for the same infrastructure represented by the same modules over and over again. Or um, especially if you have modules that you wish non-Terraform users could self-serve, um, then no code provisioning is a good feature for you to try out. So how do you get started with this feature? It's fairly straightforward. Only 
uh, module authors or organizational admins can set up no code provisioning. Um, but what you can do is designate a module at publish time or after a module has been published as no code ready. Um, and that will enable the people within your organization, your internal customers to start using, uh, start self-serving modules. Um, who is the intended end user for no code provisioning workflows? Your internal customers. Um, so, and that's in speaking to platform teams or DevOps teams. These people could be internal application developers, um, other IT people in your organization that need infrastructure, really anyone um, within your organization that has infrastructure needs, they know what they need, but they just don't know Terraform very well. Uh, so very briefly, I'll show you a little bit of what's available before we do uh, a demo to really get into the weeds. Um, like I mentioned before, one of the ways to enable no-code provisioning for your organization and TFC um, is to start by making a module no-code ready. Um, this can be done at publish time, which I'm showing you here. Um, someone publishing a module can opt to make the module no-code ready. Um, we'll note here that there are just a couple things that modules need in order to be no-code ready. And the first is a specified provider block in the configuration. Um, and then second, um, once the module is going to be used, you'll need to make sure um, through some means that the workspace created at that time will have access to cloud credentials. Um, the other way that you can make any module uh, in your registry no code ready um, is by selecting that module from your private registry if you're an admin and enabling it uh, enabling it for no code provisioning. Once you enable no code provisioning for one or more modules in your private registry, um, then you'll be able to filter on this type of module in the registry. So your internal customers, people that want to self-serve infrastructure, they can filter on no code ready and they will see all the modules that they can self-serve. Uh, once they select a module that represents the infrastructure they need, um, they click the provision workspace button, which is something that's only available for no code ready modules. From there, they'll be taken to enter the variable values that apply to them. Um, these variables are surfaced to them from the module configuration. Um, the only variables that are surfaced to them here are those that have um, do not have specified default values in the module config configuration. Then they'll name their workspace like normal and then opt to auto apply or manually apply. And from there, they'll be taken to the normal workspace output screen where they will be able to get the outputs they need to start working. Um, so real quick before we jump into the demo, I wanted to talk about a note on what's next for this. Um, like we said before, this is available as a public beta, which means um, we're eager for your feedback. We're trying out how this works, and um, we will be adjusting to your feedback in the coming months. Um, on that note, I would also like to say that we consider no-code provisioning this first release just our first step in a journey towards no-code and self-service workflows in Terraform Cloud and Enterprise. Uh, and with that, I can pass it off to my colleague, Dan, to show you exactly what a no-code provisioning workflow looks like. Thanks, Olivia. We'll get things uh, switched around here as I share my screen. 
All right. Uh, so, do Zoom still sharing? All right, so here I've got a Terraform Cloud uh, workspace. And, um, you know, I thought, uh, you know, since we, we talked, uh, Olivia talked a bit about uh, kind of the, the intention for this, right? We can take a look at how uh, we kind of would have to do things in the traditional way uh, before no code provisioning. Uh, so kind of putting on my consumer hat, right? If I'm a, a developer or an application admin looking to uh, consume some infrastructure, I might, you know, come in here and then start with the registry, right? And and like Olivia said, I would need to know something about the infrastructure that I'm going to provision. Uh, so I might start here with uh, the provider, right? I'll need to know a little bit about the provider I need to deploy. Uh, so I can come in here and and start with the provider and and you know get some some code here to copy and paste into my project. Um, but again, I need to know a little bit about this, right? What what these configuration options are. So I'm going to be doing some bouncing between docs and my code, um, you know, from this starting point here. Uh, and then the same thing would go for uh, you know modules. So here in our uh, our private registry, right? Our, our platform team has has curated some public modules. We have some private modules uh, already available here. But again, I need to know these building blocks. I need to know enough about how to put these together to accomplish what I need. Um, and so that might be you know taking a few of these, right? And again, we get some some sample configuration, but I still need to know you know what. Um, what inputs I'm going to need to supply to these and enough HCL, right, to put this all together, to put it in the right files, in the right places. Uh, and then also I need to know, you know, how to actually get this wired up to a workspace uh, in Terraform Cloud. So that might be a CLI-based workflow. It might be putting it into a Git repo and hooking it up to a VCS-based uh, workflow. Uh, but through all of this, right, this is not, this is just, basically toil, right? Getting me to the point where I can actually start developing on my app, right? And so uh, what we're looking to address with the no-code provisioning is to really just cut down that time and, and um, you know, that that toil uh, for, for application developers and consumers of our infrastructure in uh, putting this together themselves. So uh, let's take a look at, at the new way then. Uh, so kind of switching roles here now, uh, we'll first take a look at what it takes to provision or to publish a, a no-code module. Um, and then we'll we'll take a look at what it means to uh, to consume it. Uh, so again, you know, switching hats now. I'll, I'll be I'm a module publisher, right? Maybe I'm part of the uh, infrastructure team, the platform team, kind of whatever you know. However, you uh, organize that in in your organization. And just like publishing, you know, this is going to look very similar if you've ever published uh, any you know regular uh, module to the private registry, right? This is going to look very similar. Um, you know, we're going to come up here to publish. Select a module. I'm going to connect to, uh, in this case, I'm using GitHub to host my modules. Uh, just like other modules, right? When you have this uh, naming convention, they need to start with Terraform and the name of the, the primary provider in them. Uh, and we use tags, uh, right, or or releases in, uh, in the Git provider to actually version the modules. Uh, so in this case, I've got an Azure uh, no-code web server module here ready to publish. And the one new thing here is we have this setting to enable this for no code provisioning. So, um, you know, existing modules aren't automatically enabled for the no code provisioning workflow, right? We have to make sure they're ready and, and uh, go ahead and explicitly enable them to this allow list. So I will go ahead and do that. Now we get some nice tips here on the things we need that Olivia mentioned, right? And then we can take a look at uh, the code here uh, for that and simply publish module. Um, so this is gonna just take a few seconds while Terraform Cloud pulls uh, everything out of the repo, pulls all of the version information and, and actually pulls down the code and makes it available here in our private registry. And once that's done, we will see, there we go. So now we have our module here. We have just a single version uh, on this one, uh, version 0.2 that I have published in GitHub. Uh, and we see this extra badge now that it is no code ready. And that's because I checked that box. Uh, if we had some existing modules here that maybe I you know, published a new version, right? That is no code ready. Uh, we can also, uh, for existing modules, we can come over here and uh, you know, this would read enable no code provisioning. So we could enable on existing modules without having to fully republish them. Um, you see, we also now get this new button provision workspace. Uh, now we mentioned that 
you know, in a no code module. So switching over to the code here, right? This is my module. Uh, in every way, it's it's the same as any other module I would have published to the provider or to the um, uh, the registry before. Uh, the one difference is we do need uh, right here to seed that provider block, right? Because uh, in in another module workflow, right, uh, the provider information would be coming from the calling module, right? Your root module that's calling the module. Well, effectively now this is our root module, and so it needs that provider information at least enough to bootstrap the provider. Um, and you know how much you need to supply here will, will depend on the provider, right? If you can supply re, uh, environment variables uh, through variables sets uh, in the workspace, uh, the, those can can be used. Um, so I just have very basic, you know, bootstrapping of that provider. Uh, but in every other way, this is a regular uh, module. Uh, there's nothing uh, nothing extra in it um, besides you know my data sources and resources, just like uh, would normally have. So if we go back here. Um, uh, the other piece uh, that Olivia mentioned is we need to also supply credentials, right? So as part of this workflow, uh, this is actually going to provision the workspace and automatically kick it off. Uh, so for that first run to succeed when we provision a no-code workspace, uh, we need credentials for the cloud uh, provider somewhere. Uh, so there's a few mechanisms we can use to do that. Uh, over here in our organization settings, I have some variable sets defined. Uh, so for this first one, I'm going to be deploying into Azure, and I have a set of Azure credentials here that I've applied to all the workspaces in my organization, and it's supplying some environment variables to go ahead and authenticate that provider uh, to Azure. Uh, so that's one mechanism, right? Obviously, not necessarily a thing that all organizations are going to be able to do, right? This is static credentials. We're providing it to all the workspaces. Um, so another option would would actually simply be to let that first run fail, right, and then go ahead and put in the credentials as variables specific to that workspace uh, once it's been created, and then go ahead and kick off another run. Uh, and then a third option is to actually use Vault, uh, right? So our uh, HashiCorp Vault product, uh, and I've got a quick example of that. Um, and, and there are a variety of techniques for using Vault to actually go get and, and generate short-lived credentials uh, on demand uh, for our workspace. And so all of that works with no code provisioning. Uh, so it just really comes down to how you handle credentials in your environment. Uh, but if we go back here now, now I'm gonna put on uh, my consumer hat, right? So I'm a developer, I'm gonna come in here to the registry and look for, we have this filter for no code ready modules. So I can see all of the no code ready modules that uh, my Terraform administrator has prepared for me, uh, including that new Azure based web server. But well, we'll just simply need to click on that. I can ignore this code here and simply click provision workspace. I need to supply those uh, uh, non-defaulted variables, so any required variables that don't have defaults set in the actual module. So in this case, I just need a unique prefix. Prefix. We'll just call it no code dev. Then we'll call the environment dev and a workspace name. Okay. And description there. Um, one other difference you'll notice is that we default to auto apply with no code workspaces. Again, just trying to streamline that process. Uh, so I'll go ahead and leave that and start to provision. So what do we end up with? We get a workspace that is automatically triggering a run. Um, you know, here on this, this main screen, you see this is a, a workspace like any other. The one difference over here is instead of having details about maybe a VCS repo that we're connected to, we actually see the details of the module that this workspace was provisioned off of. Uh, so the the specific module and version uh, that we provisioned, uh, as well as uh, you know, a note up here about uh, the no-code workflow. And as Olivia mentioned, we're definitely interested in your feedback. So there's a, a feedback link there uh, to go out and fill out a survey. Uh, so that's going to take a minute to run. In the meantime, we can take a look at another one here. Oops, there we go. Uh, so I've got another one here that's a uh, no-code uh, static website in AWS. Uh, this is a case where I don't have AWS credentials, uh, you know, hard coded uh, in my organization. Instead, I'm going to use Vault to provision this. 
So again, we just need an environment. Uh, you know, this one I'll call dev two. Um, and in this case, I'm just you know for the purposes of this demo, I'm using a username password authentication to Vault. Uh, this could be you know whatever mechanisms you use to to access uh, your Vault instance. Uh, but in this case, at least we're you know we're we're only providing credentials to Vault, and Vault is handling uh, through in this case the AWS Secrets provider. Uh, it's going out and grabbing temporary credentials, uh, very short-lived credentials uh, for AWS. And ignore my super secret vault password there. Very secure. Give that a unique workspace name. And again, we'll go ahead and let that auto apply. So in this case, through my username, password credentials to vault, I have permissions to get that uh, temporary AWS permission. And we can see that that plan is running. Um, something else I want to point out here is that in every way, this is a full-fledged workspace, right? So we have not lost any functionality by this being a no-code provisioning workspace. Uh, you can see that as part of this run, we're going to run some policies, uh, including our new uh, OPA or Open Policy Agent uh, policy engine, uh, as well as some Sentinel policies. So now we've got our plan running. And while that one's running, we can go back to our first one, which should be done by now, and it is. So let's take a look at this one. So again, we have the reference to what module this was provisioned off of. We have our first run here, which succeeded because of that global um, variable set that we had available with the Azure credentials. And we see that we ran through all the phases, uh, including our uh, OPA policies and Sentinel policies. Uh, including cost estimation, right? So we still get all the benefits of the Terraform Cloud platform, um, but with uh, without having written a single line of code uh, as a consumer. And just to prove it worked, let's go check out the URL. And in the spirit of uh, HashiConf having just been a month ago and having the best coffee in the conference circuit, right? We have our Hashi Cafe website uh, with some lovely uh, coffee art there. So uh, another thing I want to point out too, another thing we can take advantage of, uh, some more features we announced recently at HashiConf. Again, because this is a, a fully featured workspace, right? We um, you know, we can take advantage of all the features. We already saw that we're running some uh, policy sets, right, that are made available uh, organization wide uh, to make sure that we're we're deploying compliant and and um, uh, secure infrastructure as as defined by our security teams. Uh, we can also take advantage of uh, some features, uh, relatively new features uh, called health assessments. Uh, and so this is broken down into two main features, drift detection, which we announced a few months ago at uh, HashiConf Europe, uh, which is now in GA, and also our new continuous validation, which is in uh, beta as of uh, last month. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. Actually, first, I'm going to make a change that will trigger some of my health settings. And then the way we do these checks, uh, if we go back to the code here real quick, uh, here in my uh, my Azure Web Server module code, down here on my Azure Linux virtual machine resource, I have these lifecycle pre and post conditions defined. And these are actually the mechanism for doing our continuous validation checks. And one of the conditions I've defined is that uh, because I'm using here a source image that is uh, pulled from my HCP Packer registry, uh, I can actually check that my provisioned image matches the latest image available in my registry uh, channel there uh, in the HCP Packer service. Um, so that way, if the platform team has released a new image, right, we can be continuously running these checks in the background and say, hey, you know, a newer source is available uh, and, you know, please go ahead and redeploy and update uh, update your environment. Uh, so again, just taking advantage of, of all those features of Terraform Cloud, even in uh, this, you know, this new uh, no code provisioning mechanism. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is go ahead into my HCP Packer registry here. And I know in this case, I'm uh, deploying this web server off of my Ubuntu focal image. And what I'm going to do is actually go to uh, my default 
on that module is the production channel. So that's the one I'm going to change. And I'm going to change that to a newer version of that base image. And now that that's done, back here in Terraform Cloud, I can go ahead and enable health assessments on my workspace. And within just a few minutes, that first health assessment check is going to run and check out and um, you know, check our, those post conditions uh, based on, on what was in that code. And while we're waiting for that to happen, we can go check on our other workspace and we see that our static website also deployed. Again, via no code provision, we got all our policies passed. And we have our functional website. And through the uh, fun of randomness, we also got the same coffee art, even though that I, I promise that is a random uh, thing in the background. But uh, when there's only six uh, or eight choices, sometimes you land on the same one. Good to have our health assessment here in just another minute. Uh, while we're waiting for that, we can take a look at the code for that vault-based uh, module. So this is my that S3 static module that I had. And in this case, instead of um, you know simply relying on environment variables to provide the cloud credentials, I'm using the vault provider with the login, the user pass uh, login mechanism, uh, collecting that username and password that I uh, you know had to provide when I was provisioning this. Uh, and then, you know, grabbing those temporary uh, AWS credentials and providing those uh, through that data source provider uh, to the AWS provider. And so that way we didn't have to hard code any credentials, um, you know, and, and letting Vault uh, do those uh, on demand. And, you know, with the time, you know, those credentials live only long enough basically to, uh, to let uh, an apply and a plan happen. All right, so since my health assessment hasn't run yet, we can take a look at a different workspace where we do have health, some health results here. Uh, we see that you know on this workspace, right, we have some drifted resources that we've detected. Um, and in this case, you know, we went in and added some tags, and also uh, we've got a rule missing from our security group. Um, and that other example uh, that hasn't come back yet. Uh, there it is. So now we have a health warning here on our no-code workspace. Uh, these drifted resources are just uh, some provider defaults that are coming back into the state. Uh, but what we're interested in here is our health check. And we see that we've now failed our uh, virtual machine source image check uh, because we now have a new version uh, of that image available in HCP Packer. And we get a nice notification that, hey, you know, it's time to redeploy to get that updated image. So even though I deployed this off of a no-code uh, module. Uh, I, as an application developer, didn't need to know anything uh, about kind of the underlying Terraform mechanisms that are happening here. Um, I can still get you know the, the these uh, constant health checks going on and, and uh, get that awareness that hey, it's time to go ahead and, and do a new run and uh, and update that image. Um, so that's it. Uh, so, you know, kind of wrapping up, right? Hopefully you can see how easy it is to take advantage of uh, this no-code provisioning uh, workflow, um, but also highlight the fact that it's it's in no way, right, taking away any of the power and the functionality of the Terraform Cloud um, features and, and functions like uh, policy as code and, um, and, and these health assessments like drift detection and continuous validation. So that I will stop sharing my screen. Oh no, I won't. I will head over to somewhere. There we go. Our slides. Uh, so uh, we can learn more. Uh, all these links will be in uh, the follow-up email. Um, 
Um, but for the most part, they're all available on our new uh, kind of consolidated documentation and tutorial site, which is developer.hashicorp.com. Uh, so we've taken all the, the product docs as well as all the uh, learn tutorials that used to be on learn.hashicorp.com. They're all now available on a, a great new site, developer.hashicorp.com. So we have a hands-on tutorial uh, out there for the no-code module provisioning. Uh, we have documentation on it, of course. Um, and of course, you can head over to app.terraform.io to get started with Terraform Cloud for free if you're not already uh, a customer. Uh, we also had a blog published uh, about all the new announcements for Terraform uh, at HashiConf last month. Uh, and also definitely encourage you to check out the uh, the keynote uh, from day two of HashiConf last month where uh, our co-founder and, and CTO Armand uh, went went through all these features, you know, showed them all off, um, uh, including no code provisioning and some of the other features that uh, that we showed off. And so, with that, Kyle, I'm guessing we have some Q and A. Well, I can't hear you. Trying this again. There we go. All right. So thank you very much for the, for the demo, Dan. Uh, and yes, we do have many Q&A questions that have come up uh, through the process. Thank you, everyone, for being as involved uh, with that um, as you have been. And if there is a question that, uh, that you would still like to have answered, um, definitely uh, add that to the to the Q and A uh, box there. All right, so let's go through and pick out a couple uh, that have not already been answered. Um, let's start off with a question for Olivia: um, Is there any plan or an ETA when some of this capability or functionality will be available in the TFE provider? Yes, and I'm glad you asked. It will be available in the TFE provider this month. Excellent. I like the uh, the short and simple, uh, concise and direct responses. Um, let's try another one here. Um, so, all right. So how can you make changes to infrastructure with no code provisioned resources? I think in this case, um, I think yeah, Sam, um, you just unmuted. Yeah, I can grab that. Um, yeah, so I mean, primarily, uh, you know, the the module itself, right, is is predefined, right? It 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 is a, as it was published. Uh, so really, changes are going to be by means of potentially changing variables, right? Changing those input variables you supply to it. So, you know, during the provisioning, we get prompted for those required variables, uh, but we can also go back and change or or you know supply some of those um, uh, non defaulted variables. So that some of those optional variables to change the behavior of the module, just depending on you know what what has been exposed by the uh, the module author as uh, as variables. Uh, but basically, once uh, once a no a, a workspace has been been provisioned off of a version of a no code module, right? It is locked to that version of that module, so you have that kind of predictable uh, environment uh, based on. Uh, on on that version of the module you deployed. Excellent. Um, let's go back to Olivia for another question here. Uh, so for those workspaces that are being created, is there the ability to have the naming follow a particular standard um, or for instance, be able to add something like a prefix value uh, that uh, maybe is is kind of, you know, not displayed to the user, but is then appended to the end result of the workspace name? Um, currently as part of the public beta, there is no option to establish workspace naming guidelines or formatting yet. Um, we are taking that feedback though. Great. Uh, and, and yeah, as you know, just just to echo that that last bit, you know, this is something that's in public beta. Uh, so definitely like as you're you're using this, as you're you know starting to go through some of the documentation, please do uh, report back some of that feedback to us, because that's really how uh, a lot of our features and functionality just just gets better. 
Uh, let's go to Dan for uh, a question here. Uh, where how do we you know override some of the default values uh, if we need to that you know might not have come up on that the variable input uh, variable editor uh, display? Uh, what options are available uh, to to make those modifications? Maybe you know after the fact. Sure. So um, let's say the uh, primary mechanism, right? So we saw, you know, during that first run, the initial provisioning, right, you're only going to be prompted for uh, the default or for the the required variables. Uh, so, you know, two kind of ways you could let that first run go through, right, with the defaults uh, or potentially change the auto apply to manual apply and then kind of discard that first run and go back. Uh, and again, you know, this this is a regular workspace right after it's deployed. So we can go to the variables section here and add additional variables in here and supply those values and then kick off another run to get them applied. Um, and, you know, since we very nicely have this link to the, the specific version of the module that was used, right, we can hop over there and see what all those inputs are, uh, including what those optional inputs are and what they defaulted to. So we kind of have a, a guide uh, as to what to uh, potentially set and, and what we might want to override. Uh, but that would be, be the way either, you know, do manual apply on the first run and then uh, supply those variables after the workspace is created or just, you know, go ahead and let it create and, and change them after the fact. All righty. And then we have another question here. Um, so as you kind of go through the the process, say, you know, putting on your, your module author hat, you know, as you're making updates to uh, these no code provisioning or no code ready modules, uh, what happens with each subsequent release? Um, you know, did, what what happens to those workspaces? Does anything happen? Does the the consumer have to go through and and update the workspace, or or what's that kind of workflow look like right now? Yeah, so uh, right now the uh, the workflow is basically uh, a no code provisioned workspace is pinned to the version that you originally deployed. Um, so if a uh, module author does come along and, and release a new version, right, there is uh, not currently a mechanism to update in place. Uh, the, the kind of model there is to, you know, hopefully follow the kind of the inf immutable infrastructure model, right, where instead of updating things in place, we redeploy. Uh, so right now the model would be to um, either deploy a new workspace or, you know, maybe destroy the first one and, and deploy a new one off of the new version of that module. Uh, but that is, again, something we're kind of collecting as as far as feedback uh, on, on that workflow and, and how that works for folks. Great. Let's see. Let's go on through some, some more of the questions here. Uh, a lot of questions about variables. Uh, you know, setting variables, editing variables, updating variables. Um, uh, how about the, uh, another question came in, what about the ability to have, um, you know, some kind of like variable validation uh, wrapped around those variables. Like, does does no code provisioning have the the understanding of of say uh, booleans, or does it have the the understanding difference between types? Uh, can can it kind of understand those those kind of inputs? Uh, so I think Olivia may correct me here. Uh, so I know. Uh, Today, I don't think there is a validation on that, but I, I think that is feedback we have heard and, and are taking. Is that right, Olivia? Um, to my understanding, uh, I'm sorry, is, is this a question about preventing resource collisions? Uh, no, that, that's going to be the, the follow-up question. Uh, but this one right now is, is just around uh, some of the validation for those uh, variable inputs. You know, say if somebody, you know, has defined, you know, module author has defined a variable as a number and somebody mm -hmm. enters a string, uh, does the no code provisioning workflow? Uh, um, so um, the safest way right now with no code provisioning um, is to have 
certain default values defined. And for those variables that you don't want to define default values and, and you want the end user to supply, um, right now there isn't a check on enforcing what they do enter. Um, that is a piece of feedback that we've gotten already um, that we'll probably continue to get um, throughout this beta period. And so we're already working on um, solutions to that uh, piece of feedback. Um, so we, we, we already have plans in the works to um, lock down essentially what the end user here at this page can select or enter for um, variable inputs. Yeah. And effectively what will happen, right, is that first run will fail, right? It'll, it'll error out. Uh, on that kind of type checking. Um, hopefully the module authors are putting uh, specific types onto their variable definitions. And so that type checking, um, you know, gets caught pretty early in that first run. Um, and, in, you know, you have the opportunity to then go into the workspace variables and, and correct that and, and kick off another run. All right. And so then I think we're going to wrap up on a last question. Uh, and that one is is going to be on what Olivia just brought up around resource collisions. Uh, since, you know, if if you have maybe a little broader audience who's going through and, and consuming these no code modules from the registry, you know, what happens to those resources that uh, maybe have those unique identifiers that are now going to overlap or, you know, going to end up being in, in some form of, of collision? Um, is that going to be a function of, say, the no-code module workflow? Is that going to be a process for Terraform itself, or, or really, how's that going to work out? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if I'm getting that question right, it, that's basically going to be a function of of Terraform, right? It's not something that's necessarily built into, uh, or or it's something that the no-code uh, provisioning process is going to be aware of. Um, so it's really going to be a function of, you know, if that happens, right, the the apply phase uh, will uh, will fail, um, you know, from an error coming back from the cloud provider on that kind of uniquely named resource, uh, but not something that the no code provisioning is, is going to pick up on its own. Okay, so I think at this point, we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the Q&A section. So I do want to thank everyone who submitted those, uh, those great questions. Uh, and of course, thanks to Olivia and Dan for, uh, for participating and, and really showing off uh, this great new feature. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed today's live, screen, live stream and the new feature, No Code Provisioning, which is available as a public beta in Terraform Cloud. Uh, so to get started with No Code Provisioning, you can start using it today by following our workflows or our walkthroughs on learn.hashicorp.com. Uh, I've also provided a link to it in the chat um, or by reviewing our documentation on the brand new site, developer.hashicorp.com. Uh, and that is also there in the chat to uh, click on as well. As Dan mentioned, if you don't already have a Terraform Cloud account, you can get started for free by heading out to cloud.hashicorp.com and creating an account. Uh, then finally, as we mentioned at the beginning of this live stream, we will be making the recording available after processing, which typically takes about two days. Uh, we'll send an email out to everyone who registered with that recording link, and we'll also go ahead and include uh, some of the more commonly asked questions uh, and those answers as part of that email as well. So have a great day, and thank you, everybody, for attending.